so let me get on the grandstand. Hi there, um, I'm Dirk Peterson uh, from Seattle, Fred Hutton Cancer Research Center. I uh, will introduce myself today. Um, there's no person who introduced me. I will introduce Bobby uh, Minier from SwiftStack. Um, we're both gonna give a presentation about how to uh, bring an object storage system into like a real life research environment. Um, and Bobby plays a key role in one of the um, access methods we use to store this system. So let's just get started. So what we cover today is like who we are, why we did what we do, what we did, you know, what were the requirements for our project, um, what else did we try, what we deployed, how we managed, uh, what it cost, and, and, and how does it really work uh, in day-to-day -day life, and what was the timeline. That's, uh, we saw that in implementation projects a couple of times that I assisted, the timeline is really something that uh, in cloud goes from you know, sometimes it's a couple of weeks, sometimes it's a couple of months, uh, but we're talking enterprise, and that is uh, often measured in years. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, what is Fred Hutch? We are a, <coughs> a cancer and HIV research place. Um, we uh, have about half a, million, half a billion dollar budget. We are largely funded by the uh, federal government. And uh, for the purpose of our talk, um, we uh, possess multiple data centers on one campus. That's really important here. And we also um, are um, subject to this explosion in genomic data sets. And uh, we introduce uh, chargebacks. So the chargeback is a researcher has to pay. They get a certain level for free. And then they have to pay uh, when it exceeds a certain threshold. And that's what we implemented in, in July 2014. So it's really important for this talk. Um, so why did we do it? Our researchers uh, were faced with chargebacks. They said, okay, you know, we have like, uh, we made up like NAS uh, uh, chargebacks. We didn't make them up, but we, we came to the conclusion that NAS chargeback would have to be like $40 a terabyte a month, um, and a uh, little bit is free. Um, but when federal grants are declining, you probably heard about sequestration and everything, then that's a really tough nut to swallow for researchers. Um, you know, we had a lot of discussions about it, whether that would be feasible or not, and at the end we came to the conclusion that um, they said, okay, if you charge us, you need to give us something really cheap, really inexpensive, uh, where we can store like older and also bigger uh, genomic data sets. And of course, there's this, always this misperception about like the drive from Best Buy. Um, that that uh, yeah, I always wonder if there's another company that sells like cheap drives. But Best Buy is often mentioned as an example. Um, finance, um, we maintain very uh, uh, good relationships with our finance department, and um, when they see uh, that they have to flip a bill for some storage system, they're not necessarily concerned about the cost per se. But they really, they really get worried when you come up with like 500,000 or a million dollar at one year, and then a couple of years later you, you buy another one of these things. And you know, they say, okay, you have this thing here with like lots of yellow lights, and now you uh, bring on something with green lights. But in reality, they all live side by side for a long time until you have your migration done and everything. And so they, they don't like that. And they uh, know how to use a web browser. You know, they go to Amazon uh, and they click a couple of clicks and they see you know, what storage should cost. And if that is fantastic out of line with uh, what you want to offer, then, then you have a problem. Um, so then we had, of course, the usual stuff that enterprises have always problems with data protection and archiving. In many cases, uh, data protection is, a, is an afterthought, right? You buy a fancy new storage system and then you come to the conclusion, oh, you also have to back it up. And uh, then the backup performance is not as you expected. So that we've lived through several cycles of that. We do have a very nice backup system, but still um, it, 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 it runs into scalability issues. So we, we did look for a solution, but we were not necessarily looking for an object storage system. We're gonna talk about object storage today. We talk about Swift. Um, but we were not necessarily looking for that per se. We didn't know about it, actually. Um, so you know, users wanted a mountable file system of any sort. Um, you know, they wanted to use their, their Unix tools. They wanted to continue to use their standard Unix tool. Um, and um, um, we also had this thing that, you know, you really do this for 
uh, only a subset of your users. Like 90% you know, of your users are just fine. They can use like any storage system. But the 10%, they are um, they're really the, the, the data users. And you know, we have to be careful that if you, you know, invest large amounts of like time and effort, uh, that, that you, uh, you know, not focus only on your 5%. Um, so performance needs were not too high. We, we were very we were very nimble about that, uh, but we wanted to grow about it, and we had concerns about disaster recovery. So uh, Seattle is a, uh, a place where earthquakes can go up to like 9.0, like the one that we saw in Japan potentially, and, and that gives us some worry. Um, so we wanted at least the first step to replicate our storage to multiple buildings that are a little bit further um, away from each other, but in the next phase we wanted to get out and maybe do it the R site uh, uh, at the other side of the Rockies or something like that. So a couple of key characteristics. It was like permanent static data. We wanted like POSIX permissions. Um, it, it's supposed to be optimized for economy. It's supposed to be self-protecting. We didn't want to have an, a dedicated backup system for it. Um, so a project, I, our architecture team typically like uh, dissects every project in like must have, should have, nice to have. Um, but in, in, in our case, there were lots of like must have. Uh, there were some nice to have, but uh, one of the nice to haves was this this thing that we wanted to do, like a broader storage strategy. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily a, a hard requirement, but we had really the idea that okay, you do this for like only a subset of users. Uh, who use like POSIX file systems and uh, want to like jump the genomic data in there, but it would be really good if we could also like leverage it for other things in the future. Um, so object storage, you know, scaling, manageability, no RAID systems. That that that, that sounded that 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 was a kind of like music in our ears. The resiliency. Um, but also predictability. We ran often into um, you know, performance bottlenecks when there's a RAID rebuild in our storage system. So, so the, the, the perceived predictability of an object storage system uh, is you know, lower performance in our, in our requirement, but at least that low reform performance is, is, is very predictable. That was something that we really wanted. Um, so then we heard about Swift and Swift Stack. Um, and you know, at first, we said, oh, wow, it's proven. Some really big clouds use it. You know, they have, um, I heard rumors that there's installations up to, up to plus 50 petabytes. So that, that's more than we ever will need. Uh, but you know, if we want to get there, that would be great. Uh, manageability, low cost, um, longevity. We have, um, we have some requirements where we store data like for 10 years and longer. And some researchers want to store it for 20 years and longer. Um, and they make up, or they, they, they define those requirements, and, uh, and you know, we deliver then the, the technology to, to serve that. Uh, and if you have an, um, uh, a proprietary piece of equipment, storage equipment, and you have to do these, these upgrades, then, um, then that's really not longevity, right? So with Swift, you know, the promise could be it's open source, it runs on commodity hardware, you, you might be able to run it forever, forever and ever. And then the durability part, data centers fail. Uh, we can have, um, uh, we said we can have earthquake, we can have fires, we can have disasters. Um, that, that, that was an important component there. So conceptual view of how um, um, this will work. We have like a three, basically three storage um, buckets, or we call them zones, um, in, in each of them in a, def, in a dedicated data center. And then, um, on top of that, there's a SIFS and NFS gateway, so traditional file access um, to serve our standard community. Um, the, 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 the research community, we saw, we saw that in the, or we heard this in the previous talk, is uh, it's rather conservative, and uh, a lot of object storage systems are not like uh, brought to the end user yet. Um, so we need to have some bridge technology to serve them in the meantime. Um, there were previous talks about Swift, so I may not have to explain how it worked, but, but in general, the, the, the Swift system has three replicas, or well, three replicas are recommended, and um, you, uh, they're stored in a unique as possible way. So it can either be like a single node, um, it can be a, a, a small cluster of multiple nodes, or it can be like multiple data centers that are distributed um, in multi-region across the country or across the globe. And, and, and so, you know, looking further into this, we, we really felt like, ooh, you know, look at the, look at the underlying stuff, that, that what is Swift? 
um, you know, Linux, Python, rsync, you know, those are all tools that we were already using. And we said, wow, you know, the first concept, just bringing it up, it, it, it looked really easy, it looked really great. And so we, we, we felt a lot of comfort in the resiliency here. Um, here's an architectural overview of where we, uh, where we see this uh, tier will fit. So we have, uh, typically we have a POSIX power system. This is an Isilon scale out NAS system. Then we have some uh, high security stuff. Uh, it's basically a fully audited NetApp system. Um, we have some block storage here. Block storage is rather small. So in our case, it doesn't really matter what we use. Uh, you, know, it, you could actually buy anything there. Um, and, um, and here's our economy file tier uh, with, with uh, Swift, uh, Swift stack, right? And so this is like $40 a month and this is $3 a month. So there's this, this gonna be an enormous economic pressure uh, to move as much data into this, into this tier. Um, so what were the other, I often, or I you know, get this asked, what were the other options that, that, that were out there? We, we were a long-term user of uh, GlusterFS um, for scratch spaces and high-performance computing. Um, we, we did really like it. Um, but when we looked at this, uh, there was kind of a different level of resiliency that we wanted, and we didn't really have any proof of like, scalability. Um, we also, the, the replication features that were in Gluster um, were, it's, it's probably now more upcoming, but, but at the time, they were not really widely in use, and we couldn't really find any like production deployments that did that. Um, and still, you have the RAID um, that, that you have to manage underneath Gluster. I'm not sure if that's still the case. Probably it's, it's still the case. Uh, we look at these uh, magic HSM solutions where like basically you take a file away and replace it with a little stubby step and then uh, when you hit the stubby step uh, nothing happens for like half a minute and then it tries to get it to the tape from the tape system and then move it back. Uh, and uh, we've had that in the past and it really didn't work so well. Um, um, and it was also required a forklift upgrade at some point. Um, we also looked at commercial, several commercial vendors with, uh, who were touting erasure coding. Um, and erasure coding is really good um, at first, um, but if you have to sustain a complete data center dropout, then the, uh, the, the, data, the, the erasure coding algorithm has to be more conservative. So you, you're losing some of this uh, cost advantage that you initially had with it. I'm also often asked by uh, folks from the open source community what uh, uh, how, how does it compare? And, and, and you know, why, why don't you use Ceph? We saw this talk before. You know, it's a very similar use case, high performance computing, uh, some genomic data, um, but in details, perhaps a little bit different use case. Um, and, uh, and Ceph was more targeted towards that use case. In general, you know, if, if you just want an object storage system, um, um, you can, for example, look at the lines of code that each of these uh, projects has, and you, you can go to Olo, um, which is a website that uh, analyzes lines of code of each open source project, and you see that Gluster is really, you know, ten times as heavy, um, and you know, Ceph is still um, heavier than, than Swift, and Swift is a really, really, really lightweight. Uh, piece of code, and there are some people. I'm not saying that, but there are some people who say that the that the the numbers of errors per line of code is always the same, no matter what you do. Uh, and if that is true, then um, you know uh, there would be not necessarily more bugs in a system that is like heavier, has, has more code. Um, so it's just just a you know that's just a developer view, um, and not everybody. Should, I, I think that's uh, you know plenty controversial, um, and I'm happy to discuss this further. Um, so when are the public cloud? We are um, about like half, you know, a quarter mile from Amazon AWS headquarters. Uh, we know lots of people there. You know, why don't you just dump there? And, um, and quite frankly, yeah, that's what we will probably end up doing at some point. Um, um, Amazon is, 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 is in use at, at the Hutch today, and um, you know, people like it. Um, there's still some fuzziness about uh, government policies. Uh, you have to have business associate agreements, um, and so we are moving slowly towards that. Um, and, and we will also be able to uh, prepare for this day when it comes. At some point, we believe we will live in the public cloud. Um, it may be like 10 years from now, 15 years from now, five years from now, but by actually using Swift, we uh, can use the uh, S3 API to adopt applications and, and, um, and, and programs to actually use uh, S3 compatible ways of storing data. And that means that 
when the day comes, we will be able to switch over right away without any, or well, without lots of hassles, uh, rather than having to migrate all like legacy POSIX file systems to, to the cloud. Um, but there's still, some, there's still some truth about the cost here. So we, um, we've just seen recently some cost uh, reductions in, at Google and Amazon. We see our, our NAST here is about like $40 a terabyte a month. And uh, the, 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 the public cloud is in the neighborhood of 25. That's without transfer costs. It's just storing it. Um, and Swift, uh, TCO, backup, everything included, uh, except for the data center, which we already have, um, is $13. You know, that's in, including energy costs and everything. So you know, as long as we uh, don't find it less expensive to move to the public cloud, you know, there's no reason to do it. And you know, maybe the day will never come, and then we stay there. In some cases, we will need a storage Switzerland. That means people who want to share data with us don't trust necessarily me to store that data when they're not in our institution. They want like kind of a Switzerland, and then they will use the public cloud. But you know, for many, for many uh, uh, types of data, that's not true. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. Um, so what we deploy, uh, we deploy one zone per data center, and we have the Swift management, uh, the Swift stack management node in the cloud. And that is um, something, so here we go. Um, so here's the, the bird eye view on Fred Hutch, uh, Google Earth. We see there's three zones, zone one in one building, and they're about like 1,000, maybe 1,500 feet apart, and zone two and zone three, all in, in separate buildings. So if, uh, if there's an earthquake and the highway falls on this building, we still have, we have, still have these two available. Um, and that will be without any downtime, so we would be able to uh, sustain a building failure without, uh, with zero downtime. An architecture view. Um, Again, three uh, storage zones. Um, there's an, a, a low-cost switch in each zone, and then that switch is hooked up to the data center switch, and it's hooked up to the building and the core router. So this is how it goes through the entire campus. Uh, some building blocks. Uh, we have a um, super micro uh, chassis. Um, it uses uh, desktop-grade hard drives, and uh, you know, for about 130 terabyte. Uh, usable space, you pay about you know, thirteen thousand dollars plus tax. Um, this is a discussion that, for cloud people, is you know, just why would you use anything else but um, consumer grade drives? You know, Google published this paper in two thousand seven um, that said you know those drives are just fine. They fail a little bit more often, or they couldn't even prove that they would fail more often. They found them reliable. But for enterprise uh, folks, for enterprise storage groups, that is a tough call uh, to, to say that you're using some, uh, you know, quote unquote, junk drive. Um, but the folks from, from Backblaze, that's an online backup company, they really have uh, collected some data over the last five years. And uh, they saw how, how actually, um, how actually does it look like when failure rates go up? So here's at year three, you see that these drives typically f seem to fail more. Here, five and six are projections. So they, you know, they assume that they will go there. But at year three, you really see an increase. So enterprise storage people say, oh my god, we need to replace all these drives and the sky is falling in year three. Right? But, but you know, cloud operators say, oh wow, you know, after six years, you still might have 50% of the drives in the system. That's great. You know, continue to use them. They're not broken. They work. Right. So that, that's, um, that's a little bit of a mind change in the enterprise. Um, we, uh, if, 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 if drive failure rates are like in, in the neighborhood of 8% per year, which is pretty high, we estimate that at the end of the build-out at three petabyte system, we would have 20 drive failures per month. Um, and the beauty about Swift is that you can just replace them all at once, like once a month. You don't have to like run because it's not a RAID system. You don't have to run into your data center like, uh, full of sweat um, to replace that one or two drives. You just wait. Uh, you know, over time, the storage capacity shrinks. And then when the day comes, like on the first Monday every month, you, you rip out the old drives, replace them with new drives, and you're good to go. And you could actually replace them with a bigger drive, which you know, 
has an imp impact on your storage cost. So if you had like th uh, three, uh, two terabyte drives before, you can suddenly use maybe four terabyte drives. Um, this is um, the, Net the Netgear switch component that we use, you know, $1,400 for a full 10G switch. Um, it has about, we did some performance testing, it has about 75% of uh, a Cisco switch, um, so it's, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty good. Um, it, w it, was, it took some time uh, to uh, have um, the enterprise networking team getting familiar with it. At the end of the day, we came to the conclusion it's just like an unmanaged switch. It's a, it's a throwaway piece. Um, we put like one in storage, and then uh, if it breaks, you just throw it away and replace it with something else for $1,400. It's so basically, I think it's the price of a Cisco GBIC. Uh, so that's not too bad. Um, architecture view. Um, so here you see the super microsystems, the uh, Cisco, uh, the Cisco, the Netgear switches, uh, and then you have the data center switch up here. And um, there's a NFS SIFS gateway. Um, so the totals on storage is like uh, 260 usable uh, for $83,000, and uh, the monthly cost is about $5. Um, so how do we manage it? Um, you know, the initial deployment took about seven days. Um, what's really important is that you have to make sure that um, you have a vendor like Silicon Mechanics, for example, who, who offers you these desktop grade drives and drive carriers. You can't ask your uh, storage team to get out a screwdriver and like put them into drive carriers. That, I think that's too, too much to ask. And then, you know, it's about 0.25 FTE. We calculated that. It's perhaps a little bit less. Um, so open source Swift is functional. You can, you know, just deploy it. It sounds all very easy. Um, but there are a couple of things that are really uh, not so easy, like maintenance and upgrades and uh, just the general monitoring. And we've seen people who have actually used like an FTE or one and a half FTEs to maintain uh, a Swift environment. Um, and perhaps it's even like larger, maybe, maybe three or four FTEs in some cases. So um, that's why we came to uh, Swift Stack. We said we are not people who could do that. We don't, you know, we, we want to have keep the cost low. We can't just have this storage adventure at our place and then, you know, not pay anything for hardware and, uh, and software, but then invest like two FTEs in maintaining it. Um, that would be uh, rather absurd. So we said we need to have something that does it for us. And so then, you know, Swift Stack basically came to the rescue. Um, um, you know, it provides a cloud-based management console. You have like uh, enterprise features like um, delete protection, really important uh, in standard Swift. You don't, you, when you delete your file, it's gone, right? And if you give that to your end users, well, what happens if you don't have backup? You know, you can't get the file back. So you know, Swift Stack actually offers a, a middleware layer that, that uh, uh, puts files that are deleted in a trash can for 60 days or so and then uh, they're expunged afterwards. So that's a, that's a very critical enterprise feature. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the Swift Stack controller lives in the cloud, so you don't have, have to upgrade that. You know, you, you log in and sometimes it's, there's new features, uh, they're just popping up, uh, and you use them. And you know, it's a, Swift Stack is a, is a real 24-7 um, global company, which I didn't know initially. I always wanted to, some, at some point, um, uh, their staff was answering uh, emails at like 2 a.m. in the morning uh, and said, oh, you know, he probably doesn't have really, really good sleep. Uh, and, at, 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 and then he continued doing that and, you know, I just uh, wondered what, what that was and he was actually in Taiwan. So um, Swift Stack provides all this control uh, and visibility. You know, you can completely m monitor your cluster um, with almost every detail. And the rollout with Swift Stack is literally 10 minutes. You have your Linux boxes up, you have them in front of you, you type a couple of commands, they are all there and it's like 10 minutes and you're done. Um, then the, then the, the one feature that, that, that really made us like, you know, we were just like speechless was the upgrade. So we had a, a, a full blow of like uh, files right into the cluster, you know, multiple hundred megabytes per second to it. And then at some point, uh, an upgrade button showed up. And you can just like, there's nothing more. You just click this upgrade button and silently it upgrades the entire cluster to the latest version of Swift. Um, you know, not a single ping missed. Uh, full, nearly full performance. I think it's degrading like by 20 something percent. Um, but that was, that was really a spectacular experience for us. 
upgrades otherwise eat like lots of time, and we have like project managers involved and 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 whatnot. You know, it's 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 really intensive normally for storage upgrades. So that was really good. Um, Swift Stack controller. I mentioned that. What's the difference between like Swift and Swift Stack? So the Swift Stack controller um, provides these features on the left. Uh, there's also a, a runtime on your local node, and um, you know here you just have OpenStack Swift. That's the standard stuff, Linux, and your standard hardware. Pretty straightforward. So now um, I'm going to talk about one of the most. Uh, Bobby's going to talk about the most critical component in our case. We said we can't use today the object store directly. Most of our users are, um, you know, use legacy NFS and SIFs. And Bobby's going to talk about this uh, new nice technology that's. Okay. Available today. Thank you. And again, I'm Bobby Muneer, uh, Director of Technology at Swift Stack, um, specifically focused on access methods to the object store that are not the API. And I have been working with Fred Hutch specifically on the SIFS and NFS gateway. And just going to give you a little bit of a quick you know, technology deep dive here um, and just spend a few minutes talking about it. So, if you're not familiar with a gateway, that it's effectively a means to getting data into an object store other than using the native object store a API. And its role in life is to effectively lower the barrier to entry <coughs> to being able to get data into the object store um, and use familiar IT workflows, paradigms that your, your you know, operation staff you know, sort of know and love or hate, depending on who they are, um, but just allow the object store to be utilized without having to take the time to immediately start recoding applications to use the native object store APIs. And in fact, in some cases, you know, we've specifically heard from customers that you know, they, they have certain applications that they're, they're never going to rewrite. At some point in the future, that, you know, you know, that use case just goes away, but the data persists. Um, and if you look at the, the spectrum of gateways that are out there in the marketplace right now, um, I, I like to really kind of come up with a taxonomy of, of two types here. Um, one is, how does the gateway effectively treat the data as it's being ingested into the object store? Um, there's certainly a class of gateways where they're taking the data, the files that you're wanting to upload, chopping them up into you know, very small segments, potentially performing some compression, some deduplication, and then shoving all of that, those little blobs of objects into the object store. Um, and it, you know, it's a very efficient uh, means to do it. It you know, reduces the amount of data you actually have to store in the object store. But effectively, it's now taken your data, your objects, and has you know, morphed them into something where you have no idea what form they're being stored in. And you know, what you know, I like to talk about with you know, the gateway that, that we provided is it, it's, it's a no blobification that we tried to preserve, or we didn't try, we have preserved the one-to-one -one mapping of the object as it's you know, produced by the applications and how it's stored in, in the object store ultimately. Because that's just, in, in our view, hugely important for mixed use cases. So you, know, you don't want to be able to you know, push something up in, you know, via one of these file system gateways and then want to later access that data with a different application. And you, know, you don't want to have to backhaul that data through the gateway in order to then you know, reconstitute the data and make it accessible. You just want your, these new applications to effectively be able to hit that data in the object store and, and utilize that without any other piece there. So effectively, that is you know, no technology lock-in, that the data that you put in the object store is exactly what you know and expect. And, and, and you know, I think that point gets lost on people a little bit, but it's just something I think very important um, to consider. Another element of the gateway that you know, it's, it's an ideal point for you know, possible data transformations or data extractions. Um, and there's a lot that you can imagine in terms of having you know, a multitude of gateways deployed that are all you know, pushing data into uh, the object store. 
and they can perform these types of extractions, and, and I'll talk you know, a little bit more about the metadata extraction in a minute, um, but basically give you that, that consistent view um, and enable different workflows here. Um, you know, one that Dirk had uh, mentioned, or at least had on a slide, it was this notion of write once, read many. So the gateway, again, is giving you a control point in your storage network whereby you can ingest an object and then coordinate with the other gateways to make sure that that object is then protected from future modification. So I'm just going to touch really briefly here, because this is obviously a case study about Fred Hutch and not on you know, Gateway Deep Dive. Um, but just some of the ideal use cases that you know, we see for a, a you know, non-blobifying gateway. I'm sure I'm going to patent that at some point. Um, so one is active data archiving. So when you're pushing tons and tons of data into your object store, one of the things the gateway can do is extract metadata that's inherently embedded into the files and associate that in the object's meta tags or even potentially vector that information off into an index server so that you can form these catalogs of the data that's in the object store without having to go back and try to pull or you know, search the object store in, in ways that are not currently exposed you know, in the API. And you know, I, I think that's something that you know, we've started to hear a lot of interest in. Um, and, and really the key is having an automated way of being able to pull that information out of the files and get it directly into these servers. Um, touched a little bit on this, but multi-site data sharing, whereby you can have these gateways deployed at all your remote sites. You, you have your one core centralized object store, and you want to have a unified view, again, via SIFs and NFS, your standard file system protocols, and the gateways have the ability to you know, coordinate their file system view of the information stored in the object store, and then anybody in a remote location can access the, you know, these objects just like they, they were coming out of a NAS file system and, and can do some specific things um, to uh, improve per performance there. And then finally, if this ever clicks, maybe. Ah. Data migration. So because the gateway is providing a SIFS and NFS mount point, it's just very easy if you have large amounts of data that you want to start pushing into the object store, just mount you know, a container as a, a mount point via the gateway and just start a copy job or an rsync job and it just gets all of your data up into uh, the object store without having to you know, fiddle around with, again, you know, tools or anything else. It's just you know, emphasize that the IT workflows are preserved. The IT shops are very, very experienced in dealing with gateways or with file systems and, and we'd like to just preserve that um, uh, functionality. So where do gateways go? Ah. Um, you know, right now the gateway itself is utilizing the object store APIs um, directly, again, saving you know, the potential for having to rewrite the application right now. Ultimately, I, I think there's better performance that we can get out of the gateways with um, you know, tighter integration with the, with the cluster. It's something, again, we're working at um, you know, very hard at Swift Stack. Um, and are going to continue to look at these ingest points for other types of data grooming that can be done uh, on the objects to you know, open up the potential of you know, accessing the metadata and being able to um, you know, work with the data directly. All right. Thanks. Super. So let me just. You want your phone or the pointer? What's it? <laughs> oh, yeah, that would not be good. <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay, so then let's run through it. Oops. Okay. So, one more. Um, so, with the Assistant NFS Gateway, um, I said initially that our performance requirements were not very high. Um, we actually have achieved about 300 megabytes per second. Um, and if we use uh, you know, the native uh, Swift API, um, then we can actually get gigabytes per second throughput. So that is um, 
really good. We have uh, enough performance to get started, and we can grow later, and we can uh, have people who are in, uh, in the same research uh, group who use CIFS and NFS, and then we have advanced programmers who can access the really same data. And that, that's kind of unique. If you buy like a standard file system gateway into an object storage system, then you know, really, really want to drive that home, then you necessarily can't access it in different ways, you have to like either choose CIFS or NFS, or you do object, and you know that's the that's the really the the the, the benefit, the long-term benefit that we see here from the system. Um, we have a couple of limitations um, because you map uh, object to file. It's like kind of more like a CIFS NFS bridge, if you want to call it. There are some um, limitations that um, you know you make you have to be aware of, uh, and you have to discuss with your with your stakeholders. And you know, some links uh, are not available. Um, that's for some people. It's tough to swallow, but for, for most folks, um, it was not a problem. Um, you know, you can't easily rename directory structures. You need to like copy and delete them. Um, and um, and the renaming uh, of the directory structure hangs other I/O in that certain directory. Um, so for 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 most use cases that we looked at wasn't a limitation at all, if you, if you look at it, really. And the du command uh, doesn't work on Linux, um, so you have to re rewrote a replacement for that to make that work. Um, overall, we've really um, implemented, uh, with Bobby's help, basically everything that's needed for an enterprise. Like We have like uh, esoteric POSIX permissions that we can do now. We have, uh, Bobby mentioned, that Active Directory integration has been worked on. It's improved, but it's production ready today. We use Active Directory integration today, and it works. So a uh, little bit about the timeline. We uh, started two years ago. You know, that's uh, for an enterprise. Uh, it's probably appropriate for many other use cases. You will find that amusing. Uh, but you know, two years is, a, is the timeline that we took. Uh, the initial evaluation of Swiss Tech took only two days and said, hey, it's, good. it's, a, good, it's a good tool. Uh, that took us two days and implementing it two years. Um, lessons learned are, you know, we really need to communicate with everybody at all times about uh, pros and cons and limitations and, and what the system does. Um, and you need to be ultra responsive during your test period, ultra, ultra responsive. Then you get some buy-in from people. Um, prioritizing requirements, right, you need to, like, do you really need symbolic links? Is that a requirement? Um, and if it is, you know, we need to work on them. And if not, then we put that at the back of our, of our priority list. Um, oops. So um, tape backup is a big step for people to give up, very big step. Um, and with, with SwissSec help, we really um, think we pull that off, that we can have data secure long term without any tapes. That's a big thing. So I mentioned that already, the POSIX gateway. Um, and um, I have some things that I want to um, ooh, I want to do in the in the future. You know, where where do we really land, or wh what what's the next step once we have implemented this use case? And I mentioned initially that we want to use it for other things as well. And uh, you know, we have an endpoint backup. Uh, you know, there's a product called Druva. Uh, we use CloudBerry backup. We can use that. Um, then we have uh, there's a high performance POSIX file system uh, front end. It's called Avere. That's available. Um, you know, CloudBerry Drive, Expand Drive. There's all sorts of tools um, that we want to uh, investigate uh, in the next year. So, um, we, oh, can you fire it up again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to mention this uh, as a final comment. I should probably not push too many buttons here. Uh, Shift F5. Oop. Yeah, no, leave it there. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're also working with uh, Seagate on their new Kinetic uh, platform, which is an Ethernet-enabled drive um, that uh, really uh, allows you to use a hard drive as key value store. Basically, um, you can remove several layers from, from, from the uh, from, from the Swift architecture um, and just store data directly in the drive. I mean, if we, you saw initially or before that, you know, I was really a big friend of like nimble systems, like 70,000 lines of code. Well, we've taken out lines of code. We reduce it even further. We simplify it even further. Um, and uh, with these, with these uh, new drives that uh, come online from, from Seagate. So um, I don't know if Seagate is actually here, but uh, it's, a, it's a great project, and we hope that um, that we can you know, make some good inroads on that. 
Okie doke. Thank you very much. That's it. And I have, if you have questions. Two questions. So you mentioned the uh, also for multiple gateways. So in that case, how do the gateways coordinate with one another? If you are end up writing to the same file, which is where the last file was in. There's a, a protocol that you know is being utilized by multiple gateways to communicate and synchronize their file system view. So that's that's how that's done. Well, the the file system itself does not have snapshotting, so you can keep versions within Swift. Right. So Swift has the uh, ability to keep like snapshots, uh, not snapshots, but it keeps like uh, the trash can that I mentioned before, and it also has versioning, which basically delivers you the full data protection. Right. There's one more question here. Did, did you consider more traditional HPC file systems like Cluster and uh, NFS? Um, we are currently in a project to use uh, Fraunhofer file system, uh, FHGFS, which is the highest performing uh, HPC file system that we currently know. Um, and uh, we use that for our scratch file system. But it's not for this use case. This is really like archiving long term. You know, we call it active archive, right? It's an archive that is not going away, that you can always get to uh, immediately. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.